Thank you, Chair. We're now live. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, William. Um, welcome, everyone, to this meeting of Finance, Audit and Risk Committee. Um, we have just three councillors in the room. And so uh, with everyone's permission, if Morgan does uh, arrive a little later, I shall be letting him in uh, just to kind of forewarn you, but obviously within reason on that. Um, so, uh, yeah, welcome to this virtual finance audit and risk committee that is being conducted with members and officers at various locations and communicating via audio and video online. Uh, before the meeting starts, I'd like to invite uh, Matthew, the committee member and scrutiny officer, to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that uh, members and officers are in attendance. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so just to make you aware that the meeting is being streamed live onto YouTube and recorded via Zoom. Uh, when your name is called, please indicate your attendance to confirm the required members officers are present and can be heard and uh, we can hear them. So, Councillor Aspinwall. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor North. Here. Uh, Councillor Collins has sent his apologies as well as Councillor Deacon Davies. Councillor Derbyshire is currently absent. Um, Councillor Ruggiero Chaka. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Weeks is also absent at the moment. We have um, Councillor Ian Albert joining with us this evening as exec member for finance and IT. Present. Thank you. In terms of officers, I have Suresh Patel. Yeah, but I'm not an officer. I'm an external. Yeah. Um, yep. External. Thank you. And then Nazir Mohammed. Yep, I'm um external auditor book with Suresh. <coughs> Thank you very much. Mark Chalkley. Yep, I'm here. Thank you very much. Ruben Ayavu. Present. Thank you. Ian Cooper. Yes, present. Nick Jennings. Yes, present. Thank you. And William Edwards. Present. You. And I would just like to ask, I have a person called Josh Smart joined. Um, may you confirm who you are, please? Yeah, I'm uh, a uh, senior. I work with Suresh and Mizir. Thank you very much. I'll just now run through the proceedings for this evening. Um, extracts from the remote, partly remote meetings protocol are included with the agenda, and the full version is available on the Council's website. Uh, members are requested to ensure they are familiar with the protocol. Are there any questions before we start? Right, thank you very much. I now hand back to the chair. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, uh, Josh, you're very, very welcome at our, at our meeting, but um, I didn't quite catch uh, what, it, what your title was. And uh, if somebody in IT could just change the name of Josh so that we do include the title on there, just because that's what we've all had to do. Yeah. So I'm, uh, uh, my role was the audit senior. Yeah. Okay, thank you uh, and welcome. Um, right, uh, so first thing I need to do is apologies for absence. We've kind of done that already in a roll call. We have Sam Collins and Steve Deacon Davis. Um, if you could talk to your colleagues, councillors around, uh, for any that are also missing, it would be good to get an understanding um, of that and to obviously make sure that this very important meeting is well attended in the future. Um, I don't have any notification of any other business, but I do have some announcements that I have to read out as usual. Um, in accordance with council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on mod.gov and the film recording by the NHDC YouTube channel. Uh, members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item, the detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under chair's announcements on the agenda that you will have received. Um, I also just want to check that the members that are here uh, did receive their printed copies. Look at this old school um, stuff, the paper um, copies of some of the more difficult to read uh, spreadsheets. Are there nods and thumbs up on those or is anybody waving to say they haven't had theirs? I don't know, Sam is... Chair, yeah, I didn't have mine, but I've, I'm happy with what I've got on Modgo. Okay. Great. All right. So I'm not seeing any 
any issues there. Brilliant. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. I just said um, received apologies from Michael Weeks. Um, he has some technical issues, um, so that's his apologies received. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so moving on to item five, then public participation. I have none. Uh, so swiftly on then to item number six, and Suresh, I believe you're going to uh, present the final audit results report. Well, thank you, Chair, and good evening to members of the committee. Um, I should have explained, yeah, jo Josh is probably the most important person here, actually, for me, why? because he, he did most of your audits. So um, he was keen to see the uh, the output of our work and how it was received by the committee chair. So uh, thank you for uh, uh, allowing Josh to sit in on this evening's meeting. So if you cast your mind back to the September meeting, where we actually did report our audit results report on the audit of your 1920 accounts, we said there were three key things that we were waiting to conclude. One was the pension assurances from the auditor of the pension fund. Second was completion of work by our property valuation specialists. And thirdly, when then was completion of our own internal consultation process on your audit report, particularly in respect of the impact of COVID on uh, going concern and your property valuations. Um, I'm pleased to say that during, during November, all three of those got, got concluded and uh, we were able to issue your audit opinion on the 30th of November, which allowed you to publish your audited accounts by the target date. Um, that, was, that was a very pleasing thing for me to be able to do. And um, the, 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 the council and the finance team in particular should be commended for its um, ability to, be able to have done that. Ian probably knows that um, not every authority up and down the country, dare I say, even in Hertfordshire, uh, are in, we're in that position on the 30th of November. So uh, I think, as we said in September, the actual audit itself went immensely smoothly, despite the challenges of having to work remotely. And, and those three areas of outstanding work at the time were, were partly kind of outside, definitely outside of your control, but partly outside of our team control as well. So, so it's very pleasing to be able to do that by by the target date. So for the purposes of this evening, we, we weren't going to go through the whole report again, but just to pick up on a couple of points that, that are worthwhile uh, just updating. So Nazir is just going to quickly explain what the impact of that of that pension assurances were, and also talk about the emphasis of matter that we did include in the audit report on the property valuations, which I think we did alert you to in September. But let me just clarify that we didn't include an emphasis of matter on your going concern, and you'll see in the report we've given an explanation for that. But ultimately, that was about did we think that the going concern disclosure that you made was so fundamental that we needed to highlight it to the readers of the accounts. And we concluded on the basis that um, you were very transparent in your disclosure and clearly you're managing the impact as, as effectively as you can, that we didn't need to emphasize that matter. So hence, we didn't include an emphasis on matter on going concern. I'll let Nazir just pick up the, uh, the pensions point and the, and the property valuations point, and then I'll just close on the fees page. Nazir? Perfect. Thanks, Suresh. Um, just uh, recalling from September where we had a property valuation as a significant risk as compared to our planning where it was a higher inherent risk. And the reason we uh, upgraded our risk to significant was uh, mainly due to the material uncertainty reported by the valuer. So the authorities uh, ex uh, uh, internal valuer uh, did disclose the material uncertainty in its year end valuation report, and that was in line with the valuation risk guidance. Uh, to address that, the authority repeated the, the same un material uncertainty in the statement of an accounts. And to address that, uh, we have engaged our real estate specialists as well, uh, where our specialists review certain samples, including the church gate shopping center. Uh, based on the review from our valuation experts, they have concluded the valuation is in line, it's, it's reasonable. Uh, and we have also concluded that the material uncertainty does not exist for uh, property valuation. However, as Suresh mentioned, we have included an emphasis of matter paragraph in our audit report. And just to clarify on that, uh, an emphasis of matter is not a modification of our audit opinion, and it is just a paragraph in our audit report which highlights a disclosure in the statements. In this case, it's about the material uncertainty, uh, which we think it's of importance to the users understanding the financial statements. Uh, the other area which was outstanding in September was pension liability valuation. Uh, 
So we have concluded our work in November, but in October, uh, the authority received a revised valuation report from the actuary, and there was a change of 206,000 of <coughs> reduction in net liability. Uh, the main reason for the change was because of McLeod adjustments. And uh, we have also received the pension uh, assurance from the pension fund auditor, and we, uh, there were no major issues to cover on that. Uh, that's where we have concluded our two key areas outstanding. And, and, and I should say on both of those, so the emphasis of matter on property valuations and the sort of late adjustments that you made on your pensions liability, are pretty common. We're pretty common this year, as well, pensions in particular, as, as is most years. But the emphasis on matter of property valuations is appearing in the majority of councils who hold significant, pro significant property value, uh, assets on their balance sheet, particularly if you've got investment properties, which are clearly affected by the market volatility at the end of uh, March 2020. So finally, then, to wrap up and then we'll take questions, just on page 32 there, we've indicated... Uh, obviously, the areas of additional work that we were required to undertake, uh, largely driven by the impact of COVID-19, uh, we indicated a range of additional fee there. We are currently putting together the final quantification of those fees, which we'll share with Ian and have a discussion around, around those before submitting our proposal to PSAA for final approval. We'll stop there, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and yeah, pleased to see uh, that we are one of the few authorities that were in the position that we were. So congratulations to all. Um, first of all, I'll go to Ian uh, Cooper and or Ian Albert to see if there's any further comments that you want to make. Just a nod or a shake will be fine. And then we'll see if there are any questions. No, nope. anything from you, Ian Cooper? No. Nope. Uh, okay, any questions or comments from the committee? Nothing at all. Josh, I bet you're glad you came. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and, and congratulations once again for, for getting us to this point. Um, I, I understand the piece on fees is, is still to be confirmed. So uh, yeah, I appreciate your openness um, in sharing that with us today and, and very happy to, to note that. Um, I am just a little bit, uh, you'll have to forgive me because this is very small screens. Um, and I'm just trying to make sure that we've just got the recommendations right. And as I understand on this, we're just noting that. Is that right? Noting this report at this stage, brilliant. Thank you very much. All right, um, I am going to move on then uh, to um, the item seven, SIAS update on progress against the audit plan. Um, did anybody want to leave at this point? I know that's- Yeah, some... we're gonna drop off, Jeff, that's okay. It's absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. And good to meet you, Josh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if I can hand over to Mark then to present the SIAS update against the audit plan. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a relatively brief update from me today. So you'll, you'll be pleased to know that I won't take up too much of your time. Um, so I'm going to shoot down to page 53 and just introduce the table at uh, paragraph 2.2 where this highlights. Um, all the final reports that have been issued since the, the committee last met in September. Um, we've concluded quite a lot of work in the three months since the last committee. So um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to pass my thanks on to um, officers for their engagement over the course of this whole year, but particularly over the last three months where we've closed a lot of projects down. Um, the, paragraph, the, the paragraph at 2.3 just notes that I've appended the, um, the report on the review of the effectiveness of the file committee to this report. Um, that's just to bring that to members' attention, to, to note the contents of it and um, to kind of draw attention to the um, advised actions in section four. Um, paragraph 2.6 on page 54, um, I just want the committee to note uh, an amendment that we've made to the plan. Um, the community engagement audit was originally um, planned for 15 days. We've reduced that down to 10 days um, in order to release five days to complete an investigation into um, a community facilities capital grant that was um, that was awarded in, in May 2020. Um, you'll note in that paragraph, I, I have said that the 
outcome of the investigation is confidential, so I, I'm unable to share any more information. Um, however, the recommendations that we made in that report um, will form part of the community engagement audit, so will be reported to this committee um, one, once we've concluded that, that um, review. Um, moving down a page to um, the table at paragraph 2.8, um, I just want to give you a, a couple of quick updates to the performance figures that we're reporting from the 18th of November. So as of uh, Friday last week, we've now delivered 187 days and that's 64%. Um, and we've issued one more project to draft. So we're now at 13 out of 24 projects and 54%. So at this stage of the year, um, whilst it seems strange saying just over 50% is roughly where we want to be, given we're nearly 75% of the way through the year, we are pretty much on profile. Um, a lot of the work that starts in, in this quarter, September, um, October to December, we wouldn't have expected to have been completed yet. Um, so that that's why the profile seems slightly behind where you might expect it to be. Um, but having said that, I am confident for the rest of the year. Um, as I reported last time, all work's allocated. Um, most of the work is now planned, um, or, or at least in planning, to, to start thinking about what we're going to be doing and, and um, getting engagement from officers. So I'm, as we sit here today, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll, we'll um, achieve our, our annual target. Um, and just a quick update on the customer satisfaction questionnaires that get sent out at the end of each audit. We've received further two back in the time between um, this report being published and today so we've had seven returned out of eight issued um, all of which have been returned at satisfactory level um, and I think the one that is the one that hasn't yet been returned was only issued just before this report was written so we wouldn't have expected it back immediately. Um, if we can go down to um, appendix B on page 59 um, this just provides the committee with the officer's latest update on the implementation status of the high priority recommendations that remain outstanding. Um, some of them haven't yet reached their target date, and I think um, both of the recommendations that are included in this report are in progress and on, are on their way to being implemented. Um, Obviously, the 30th of September has passed, but there has been a fair amount of disruption this year since that target date was um, that target date was agreed. So um, these will be followed up next time for the March committee, and the the general um, feedback from officers is that they should be implemented by then. Um, I think both recommendations they've said that the work is is in progress and, and on track, um, albeit past. September. Um, the appendix appendix C and the table included there, um, that again is our, our timetable of, of work that's underway and, and taking place and you'll note that all work up to the end of quarter three has been planned or started or finished, um, which is a really good position to be in. Um, I would expect at least one or two of those projects to be finished this side of Christmas. Um, so that puts us in a really good position going into quarter four, um, where we've got a very small number of audits planned, um, particularly with uh, King George V playing fields and Workman's Hall, a, a very, very small project. So, um, as I said, I'm, I'm confident that when we get to the end of the year, we'll be in a really good position in terms of um, our targets. Um, and then the final part that I just wanted to draw your attention to was the... Um, the appended report, uh, Appendix C, and um, our overall conclusion was that um, the FAR committee is compliant with SIP for best practice, um, so that's a really good outcome. And we've highlighted um, four actions um, under Section 4 on page 70 um, in order to, to maximise the effectiveness of the committee. Um, there are four things that, that we think you should be thinking about as a committee. Um, as we kind of move into the to the next year. Um, that's all I was planning to update you on, Chair and Committee. So if there's any questions, happy to take them. Um. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, do I have any questions?
questions at this stage. Uh, Sam North, you've got your hand up. Thanks very much, uh, Mark, as always. Um, just one very quick question on the investigation you mentioned. Um, clearly, if it is confidential, uh, it needs to stay out of this meeting, but who is it being reported to um, and who is um, managing it from a membership perspective? Um, the the report's been issued to the uh, Deputy Monitoring Officer and the Section 151 Officer. Um, I don't know whether Ian wants to add any more to that. That's what I was going to say as well. Yes, it's been issued to and yeah, it's being dealt with as a result of that, the findings are being used as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there any other questions? I'd like us then just to, to, to linger on that Appendix uh, E, uh, the Section 4, um, blah, 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 looking ahead. Um, so the uh, looking ahead at kind of the effectiveness of the FAR committee. And I think just noting there at the top, uh, couldn't agree more about the role of this committee becoming increasingly poignant, significant external pressures um, being faced by the council in the coming year. So I think it's important that we do look at those recommendations and, and kind of I'd like us to, to just have a moment to think about how, how happy we are with those recommendations. Is there anything um, that you think is missing or is there anything that you desperately disagree with? Uh, they are quite significant for this committee. Uh, so yeah, if we could have a moment just to ponder on those. Uh, Adam, you've got your hand up. Thanks, Chair. Just to, exactly on that, um, just whether or not there's a process for us to look at those. And in particular to 4.4, I completely agree with the independents. Um, around cabinet members, if that includes deputy cabinet members as well. Yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? So I think in terms of the process, um, it would be good uh, if we, yeah, Ian, if you just want to, are you going to cover that off? Is that why your hand's up? Yeah, I was, going to, I was going to answer. Um, I, I guess in terms of process, um, you can't directly control either 4.3 or 4.4. 4. Um, 4.3 is a matter for the constitution uh, to allow that to happen. 4.4 4, uh, is a matter for nominations at annual council. Uh, but obviously now is the time where you can make a put your views forward in relation to that. Um, I think picking up the kind of point you made about deputy members from a practicality point of view in terms of the a joint administration if you take out four, 14 uh, members of the joint administration the Labour and Liberal Democrat groups you probably haven't got enough people left to go on um, so realistically it can't exclude all those number of people particularly if you're excluding Ovi and Scutney as well um, so it is a balance and it's about getting the kind of the, the right degree of independence it's a really tricky one, isn't it? We end up running out of people quite quickly once we start to put those limits in. But I do think, um, and I'm not hearing any any strong objection, that as baseline principles, they are they are sound. Um, okay, so I think 4.3 and 4.4, we, we all sound as they were in agreement with. What about this uh, 4.5 around this, this kind of work plan at the beginning of the year and maybe being more cohesive in terms of the agenda planning with overview and scrutiny. Um, any, any thoughts on that? I personally think that that is a, a wonderful idea and I do sit on both at the moment um, and, and find that we often overlap. And if Sam Collins were here, we'd be laughing about just how many times we're not sure where we should speak about things. Um, so yeah, any, any, any thoughts or, or, or strong opinions either way or ideas on how we can make that happen? Welcome thoughts from officers as well at this stage. Ian. I'll come in then. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, I think we've come across a number of times this year where I guess fires want to look into things from the risk perspective that actually are probably more scrutiny functions, but there may also be things missing the other way. Um, so maybe at the start of each civic year, we do coordinate um, a meeting between the chair of FAR and the chair of Open Scrutiny to kind of look at some of the hot topics that might be coming up and determine where they should sit. 
and get the balance right between the right number with each committee, but also the right constitutional um, perspective on each of them. Um, and yeah, I think that would be a good way forward, probably after the first meeting of this committee in the new year, in the new civic year, to make sure we're going to get the view of the members of the, of, of the committee before we have that meeting. Yeah, I agree with you, um, and I'm not seeing anybody anybody objecting. So, um, in terms of making that happen, then Ian, are you are you happy to take that away, or would that perhaps sit with um, with with you, Matthew, in in committee services? I'm not sure the right place for that to sit to just make sure that those meetings happen. I feel as though Ian, if you keep that as a as a kind of overview objective, that would be helpful because obviously you've been part of this conversation. Oh, a hand went up and then went down again. Absolutely. Yes, happy, happy with that. Yeah, leave that with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then, of course, we've got this learning and development. Um, and I mean, this is this is always here, isn't it? That that we probably, I think, members would would all uh, know, would all put their hands up to say that we just don't do enough um, of the L and D stuff, and it's very very difficult to to get that in. I know that Ian every year does a skills uh, a, a training needs analysis to, and, and attempts to get that through. Um, I think I think that at the beginning of, of the next civic year, we have to prioritise that for this group. Um, I, having sat on it for two years now, I can you know I, I can only imagine what it feels like for someone that's been on it for decades of, of having similar conversations um, year in year out. So I think we do we do need to and. I'm not seeing anybody saying no this is unnecessary uh, so yeah so in terms of recommendations for this we need to then note this um, as a whole report uh, is everybody happy to do that yeah good all right so we'll do that then and if we can take if we can if you can note that the the committee are in agreement with those suggested uh, suggested actions in looking ahead that would be great uh, okay, uh, item nine then, the annual governance statement, and uh, I've got Ruben presenting that one, please. Uh, apologies, Chair, do we miss agenda item eight? Oh, sorry, don't apologise, just tell me I've done it wrong. Uh, Didn't want to say anything. <laughs> hey, Nick. Very kind of you, Nick. <laughs> Off you go. Uh, progress with the delivery of the 2021 anti fraud plan, please, Nick. Right. Well, as I uh, thank you, Chair and uh, members, as I'm aware that uh, Ruben will want to get on quickly, I, I, I shall get a shift on and follow Mark's great example. Um, so my report just provides members with progress against the Council's anti fraud plan for the current year uh, and SAS, SAS performance against its KPIs. Um, my report starts at page 71, but actually page 79 of your bundle, you, you'll find the annual uh, pl or the plan for uh, this year, Appendix A and the KPIs for staffs and the progress against delivering those are Appendix B on page 89. Uh, very pleased to uh, advise members that all KPIs are on target uh, to be met this year. Uh, just a quick apology for me about some of the acronyms that we use uh, in that table uh, on page 89. Uh, if members do want any explanation of the various acronyms that we use, quite happy to go through those, uh, but I don't want to bore you with the detail. Um, just, if I could just touch uh, very briefly on the COVID pandemic and how we're dealing with this as a council forward function at the present time. Um, I, I have covered this in some detail in the report, but I just wanted to mention it here as well. Members have previously raised the issue of those new and award, award, emerging fraud threats uh, that relate to the pandemic. And I may recall from our previous report in July uh, that much of the delivery of our business as usual work uh, is, 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 was then and still is under constant review. Certain parts of the service, such as face-to-face -face meetings, interviews, training, uh, remain largely suspended at present, but we're still able to provide a, a good response on, on those new areas of fraud that, that are emerging um, on the back of the uh, COVID pandemic, um, and particularly where those are likely to impact on the council. Um, and just very briefly going through those, I know they're in the report, but I'll just, just go mention them. That is the work uh, that, we've, uh, that we've done, working very closely with the the business rates team looking at the grants and the, the potential fraud around the grants process. Uh, we're currently supporting the council's business rate team to collate and review the data they've collected as part of that activity uh, for its reporting to Bayes. Uh, and we're preparing for further similar schemes to support businesses as they're rolled out by the government. So just again, learning from, from what we did the first time around to make sure that we can avoid, avoid any fraud occurring because it's much easier to prevent it than it is to investigate it later on. 
Um, uh, and again, for the grant schemes, we are just looking at that, that post payment assurance work. Um, we are having to collect some information, collect some information uh, with the cabinet office using their spotlight system uh, with the National Anti-Fraud Network. And this year, as part of the National Fraud Initiative submission, the council will be required to submit all grant data uh, for uh, the cabinet office to review that as well. Uh, we've provided some enhanced alerts around those new fraud threats as they arrive. So particularly mandating phishing frauds. Uh, and Ian's probably fed up with receiving my uh, emails every week with the latest scams and spams that we're, that, that we're seeing going on. Uh, but we are, we're, we're receiving that information from a variety of organisations, including the Cabinet Office, SIPFA, the Credit Industry Fraud and Avoidance Service, uh, the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau, the National Anti Fraud Network, Arts Police, through its Owl Business Watch and Neighbourhood Watch schemes. So we're trying to collate that information and share it with officers uh, and, and just try and share those things that are relevant to, to the council. Uh, we have still, we've still seen these phishing emails being sent to local residents, reported to be from the council or government bodies, uh, offering uh, routes in for grants uh, or refunds on council tax. That's still a very, very uh, present issue for us. Um, but as we come across them, uh, we continue to report them into the Cy National Cyber Security Centre and we're sharing that information with CIFAS uh, and with Action for All as well. So if I just, just turn back to the main body of my report, on page 73, uh, we just talked there about the County Fraud Officer uh, that is currently working uh, for North Harps District Council and the support the officer receives from the intelligence team. And just so Council is aware, intelligence team, team will deal with all allegations that are received uh, affecting all of our partners, including uh, North Harts Council. Um, and they collate, uh, review, corroborate, uh, and build a file uh, for each of those cases uh, that needs investigation. Uh, the Intel team also provides us with a, a, a resource around accredited financial investigations. Uh, this year, uh, our, uh, our investigator has been working with the council on uh, looking at the recovery of fraudulent grant payments and we do have one or two cases at the moment that, that are still under investigation and our data analyst as well has been providing some additional support uh, and training when it's required for officers to, to assist with this year's national fraud initiative but i have to say north hearts district council do a great job of that it's a big shout out to Ian and his team uh, they they're, they're, they're just commensurate professionals when it comes to providing data for the cabinet office uh, as part of the national fraud initiative so um uh, just a just a shout out to those officers that have dealt with that this year um, on page 74, section 2.5 to 10, uh, we just talk about some of the work that we're doing around building on that existing anti-fraud anti culture, uh, looking at awareness and training, making it as easy for staff and the public to report suspicions of fraud. Uh, the council's web page is currently linked directly into the SAF's homepage, so there's an online reporting tool, options to use a hotline, email, uh, contact us to report fraud. Um, so we're trying to make that as easy as possible for people to report concerns to us, uh, whether they're members of staff or, or the public. And then on page 75, we just uh, mentioned there uh, about the reporting of fraud. Uh, so section 211 to 212. Uh, we had noticed a little bit of a dip in referrals across all of our partners between March and July, and there are probably a variety of reasons for that. So we ran uh, a campaign in August to try and raise awareness uh, uh, for, for residents across the county of, of the risks of fraud to the local authority. Um, that campaign was a social media campaign that reached over 350,000 residents uh, across the county. It saw our referrals uh, double across the partnership uh, just in a couple of weeks that we ran that campaign and the hits on our web page uh, went up from around 100 a week, which is normal for us, to 700. So uh, we had a little bit of a tsunami of work uh, coming in in August, and then we added to that further uh, in November, because we, again, with the council and with SAFs, we supported International Fraud Awareness Week with some local campaigns as well. We're still waiting to see what the outcome from that was, but we certainly saw an increase in uh, visits to our web pages and reported fraud as well. So for this year so far, we've received 66 allegations. Uh, so these are allegations of fraud, they're not necessarily uh, Fraud as such, they're just suspicions that are reported through investigations. Uh, this is slightly higher than at this stage compared to previous years, indicating perhaps that our cam campaigns have been effective. Um, but um, um, overall, uh, that, that's a fairly good number for us to be looking at. Uh, we've, we're certainly you know, going to be topping over 100 uh, referrals coming into the service this year for North Hearts. 
Uh, page 76, we just again touch on the number of cases that are currently have either been investigated and closed or are still uh, being investigated at the moment. Uh, the, the number of live cases at 49 is, is fairly manageable for us, uh, but if it started to creep up above that, then we'd be making decisions and sort of having a conversation with Ian about what, what we do with the um, overflow of work uh, that we might have, but at the minute it's, it's, it's at a manageable level. Um, on pages 76 and 77, we just provide that, that detail, uh, a bit more detail about what we're doing with the, the COVID work or link work that's linked to COVID. And then finally on page 77, uh, there's some detail there about the proactive prevention uh, work that officers and staffs have undertaken uh, so far. And again, as I mentioned there about the uh, NFI work um, and the other data matching data analytics work that we're doing uh, to support the authority. Uh, and Chair, that's my report, but I'm happy to take any questions from members. Thank you very much, very thorough. Um, uh, okay, uh, anything that anybody wants, any questions or comments on that report? Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. And Ian Cooper, this committee is becoming your fan club. Um, I'm sure you come here for an ego boost, but uh, and, and well deserved. Uh, so yeah, well done and uh, noted the, the shout out to Ian and his team there in, in terms of the work that they've done. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's, uh, that's great. And I think our Thanks, yeah. is again just to note it. So committee happy to note it? Yeah, okay, wonderful. Thanks, uh, Chair. Now, uh, uh, you're free to go if you wanted to. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, Chair. <laughs> Thank you very much. You too. I'm going to take that opportunity as well, Chair. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> sorry. I just thought you enjoyed it. Um, okay, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Anyone else wants to drop out, that's fine. Uh, uh, but, Ruben, not you. It's over to you now for the annual governance statement. Curses, nearly. Um. Thank you, Chair. Um, very swift report here this is to bring this bring this report brings an update to the action plan for 2020 21 it was part of the final annual government statement which you considered on 7th of september i'm not going to go line by line but just to say the preparation of the, the statement and the action plan is a chance for you um for the NHDC to consider its robustness of its governance and its internal control arrangements so it's always useful for it to come back to here um, 8.2 talks about the five actions at Appendix A. They are all ongoing this year, um, and I will come back in March to provide a further update. And I'll just spin down to page 95 to outline those five. So the first is the ethical awareness training. Um, there's a, there's a, a need for both increased staff and member uptake of that training. There, has, there is a, a quite an extensive induction program for members now, and there are two member champions. So they, are, they will probably be progressing those throughout the year. The second is regard to the new grant policy. We revised the policy criteria for the grants at the beginning of the year. So my team are looking at, looking at the, width, the width and depth of who is now applying and will come back and provide a report probably to council and cabinet at the end of the civic year. The third one is regarding the gender pay gap report action plan and that is online but there's a list of actions there and that's ongoing and that report will be uploaded at the end and updated at the end of the civic year as well number four talks about the lga peer challenges um, you some of you will be aware of the shaping our future program which has been established to take forward that organizational development that the, the challenge talked about there is a steering group of members and officers and there are various information sessions that have been held in the last couple of months to update staff on what this will mean to them and how they can in input to that. And the last one is around the recovery project board um, in regard to our actions towards COVID. There are weekly groups chaired by the managing director. The board meets on a fortnightly basis and it, it, it moves between response recovery as we move between lockdowns. Um, that's all I wanted to say there, but I'm happy to take any questions from anyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben. And may I say, I like the brevity and clear layout of your report. Um, uh, any questions or comments for Ruben? Nothing at all. Okay. Oh, I have a hand up. Ian Alberts. If, if I might indulge, Chair, uh, just, to, just to 
obviously emphasised for, for councillors here, but obviously for councillors here to take back to their colleagues the importance of doing the ethical awareness training. I can't emphasise Ruben's point enough and take up is still a bit woeful uh, on that. And I know obviously the member champions are taking that up, and uh, but we do need to do more. And I certainly would expect everyone on this committee to have done it, if, if, no, if nobody else. Thank you, Ian. Um, I was going to say the same thing, and I'm also going to hold my hands up and say that I'm one that hasn't, so I will make sure that that is done before the, uh, before the week's out. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? No? Oh, Adam. I do have one question. Um, I'm pleased to see the recommendation to the gender pay gap report being taken forward. And it may not be the right place for this, but are there is you know is there a similar group looking at other pre protected characteristics such as race, um in in the council yeah. taking forward similar actions such as unconscious buying, unconscious bias, looking at our recruitment selection methods. I could actually answer this one, although I'm sure that Ian will, uh, will want to come in. As well. But I had a really really good conversation with uh, the acting HR uh, services manager yesterday. Um, and it, it was more of a kind of chat between two people who do this for a living. Uh, but yes, I'm, I'm very, very comfortable with, with what, the, what NHDC's HR team are doing in terms of all areas of diversity and inclusion. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ian, but the, the gender pay gap group is, has now been extended to become an inclusion group to look across all areas of, of uh, diversity and any, any sort of protected characteristics. So that includes race, disability, et cetera. Um, and I'm really personally very impressed with the work, so, so I'm happy to endorse that. But Ian, I don't know if you wanted to just make a comment on that because they're in your area, aren't they? Uh, yeah, that's correct. I think it, it was already kind of morphing into discussing a lot of the topics anyway, uh, to take the view that it should formally change its name and change its remit. Um, and I think it also goes beyond that as well. It's not just about recruitment and HR processes. It's a much wider group now. It's looking at equality and diversity and inclusion across anything it wants to get its hands on, really. Uh, Ruben's done a lot of work uh, in terms of forming a sort of terms of reference for the group and is currently sort of caretaker chair of the group. Um, but again, looking at as much inclusion as we can and looking at that chair, maybe changing in future as well, just because Ruben leads in equality doesn't mean he always has to lead on everything to do in that area. So yeah, we try to kind of broaden it out as much as we can and making sure there's links in for leadership team as well. And also in shaping our future because we don't want it to, the group to sit in isolation. The group needs to feel like a report and ensure that actions are taken as a result of it. Brilliant. And yeah, like I say, um, certainly in terms of, of the, the, the inclusion in that in, with the shaping our future strategic piece, I think is very impressive. So um, yeah, Ruben, if you wanted to just make sure that the, the, the group knew that we were really pleased with, with, with the work that's coming out of that, I think that would be really good and that, and that we fully support it and, and uh, uh, delighted that it is in existence. Um, any further questions at all for Ruben on the government statement? No, okay. Um, I think that means, Ruben, you, you are also free to go. Thank you kindly. <laughs> oh, Cheers. Okay, have a lovely evening. You too, thank you. Okay, Ian, it's over to you now for, for all of the rest of the meeting. <laughs> so uh, do you want to just take us through the risk management update, item number 10? Thank you, Chair. I'm just trying to start the report. I'll be there for you very, very quickly. Um, so. Yeah, um, so a, quite a busy uh, risk management group at the last meeting and um, sort of two key things coming out of it, uh, although much more discussed than what I'm going to talk about now. Um, firstly, uh, the proposal to change the risk in relation to the impact of COVID-19 on, on our leisure uh, management contract. Um, now, I'm sure you'll be aware that as, we have, as we've had these lockdowns, it's meant less sense of closed and therefore that places huge financial pressure on, on SLL uh, and therefore us in, in relation to those. Uh, there will be a report going to Cabinet and then on to Council um, in December and January respectively around sort of the level of that additional support. Um, as I'm sure you appreciate, some of that is going to be part two. Um, so can't wait to see all the details of it tonight, but 
but please be assured that you know kind of that, that that's going for that process to make sure we're getting the right governance right in terms of proving what what support we do provide to 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 sll um and hoping that the end is in sight and maybe we will avoid any more lockdowns and closure of the of the leisure of the leisure centers because you know they, they provide both uh, a nice income source uh, uh, as well as valuable valuable um, um facilities for, for our residents as well um the second another area of significant discussion and this was as requested by this group um was a discussion around the risks in relation to um commercial um and we had quite a detailed discussion um two of the members of this group councillor uh the council of Northern Collins were able to attend the group, which is really good, uh, and we were able to, uh, to, to sort of go into that in quite a lot of detail. Uh, I'm not going to go forward discussion about here because it would take us too long, uh, but I hope that the conclusion of that was that we kind of think really got into the depths of, of those risks, and I think really appreciated where they where they were and that the appropriate measures were in place. Um, so that's kind of the discussion at risk management group. Um, in summary, and then the other part of this report tonight is asking you to refer some recommendations onto cabinet in relation to the risk management framework. Um, so SIAS have undertaken a, an audit of, of that framework and found some weaknesses in our controls in relation to it. And actually, I think it's where we set control levels too high. We've kind of tried to do too much and actually uh, a better focus of the way we do our work in relation to risk will lead to better results. Um, given you know both in terms of the risk team and across the council because managers are key in managing risk you know resources resource levels and staff levels are, aren't the highest and we've got other things to be doing so we need to be you know, mindful of risk but not to rule everything we do um, so a lot of proposals as summarized in the appendices sort of relate back to the findings of the audit report and getting the right degree of control in place um, so in terms of the recommendations, there's recommendations there to refer on to cabinet, as well as the recommendation in relation to the leisure management uh, COVID-19 risk. Uh, obviously, have to take any questions uh, arising from that report. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Ian. Uh, oh, and thank you, person that just bought me a massive Toblerone. <laughs> um, okay, so focusing on this then, I am... Um, I do have a couple of questions. Does anybody else have any before I ask mine? No. Um, I, I'd just like to ask a little bit about where obviously COVID-19 has, has been on here and has, has kind of changed the landscape for us. I'm presuming that um, the risk management group hasn't, hasn't had discussions around what next in terms of where we are today and i appreciate that it is a, a daily changing um situation and sky news have just told me that the, the vaccines have arrived um so has have any of those conversations happened and do we have any idea on what the kind of uh, what, what will need to be in place and what the limits and levels are in terms of dropping that risk or, or changing the, the mitigating actions with those risks It's a difficult one to answer on the basis that it's such a, at the moment, such a wide ranging sense? risk. Sorry. Um, I think the risk as it stands covers both um, the impact of COVID-19 on our services um, and on our finances, as well as starting to look at elements of recovery. Um, you know, going back a few months, we were looking at recovery uh, and now we're back into kind of um, reacting to, to managing the situation as it stands at the moment. Um, I think there'll be a need as we emerge, hopefully into sort of spring next year to look at um, splitting that risk out a little bit and looking at you know, the impact on services separately, maybe from the recovery phase uh, and then determining- I'm very sorry, but I'm having connection issues. I don't know if anyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. I can hear you, Chair. I think we've lost. Oh, Chair, you are back. We can, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Sorry, I just had connection issues, so I didn't hear any of the answer to that question. 
Um, I guess I'll summarise that in terms of, I think as we, as we move post-Christmas into spring next year, there'll be a need to look at the risk again and work out what elements of it are continuing as kind of a service impact side of it and, and what sits there in terms of a, a recovery side. Obviously, some of the recovery side won't be necessarily a risk. It will just be an action plan for the recovery group to kind of look at. Um, but we, need, we will need to review it at the start of next year or as and when it sort of seems appropriate to. Uh, Councillor Asma, are you, are you having some problems with the connection? Having some connection issues, I'm very sorry. Um, if, Sam, if your connection is more stable, do you want to just take over the chairing for now? I'm, I'm a bit stuck. I usually would say yes, but I understand that if you've left or cannot connect, we wouldn't be core it. Um, so I don't believe we can proceed without you um, being here. Okay, well, it seems to be stable for the moment. I will turn off... Uh, my phone maybe that's if you want to change turn your camera off as well chair that may help you am i allowed to do that yes yeah, you are allowed to turn your camera off great okay uh ian i'm very sorry but i didn't um i didn't catch the answer to that but i am confident that it was a good one and i will watch it later on youtube um, uh, are there any other questions or comments arising out of that conversation uh for ian i've not got any hands up Okay, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll move forward then if everyone is happy to. I believe the recommendations in this uh, meeting, in this section are just to note and see the report. The recommendations yeah. chair are to um, note the corporate risks for the quarter, namely the review of the COVID-19 leisure management contract risk with a proposed increase in the score from eight to nine and 2.2 is to note the report and also recommend to cabinet the amendments to the risk management framework as part of the management sponsored SIAS audit. Um, as there are two recommendations, could we take the vote on that, please? Yeah, okay. Uh, again, I'm dropping in and out. Ian Cooper, you've got your hand up. Yeah, can I just clarify there's an incorrect oh, recommendation in 2.1 that will need to be referred along to the cabinet to approve that change to that risk. Um, so could I change 2.1 with your permission, Chair, uh, to the, the cap that the committee recommends to Cabinet um, that the, the corporate risk of the quarter, namely the uh, review of COVID-19 leisure management contract risk for a pros change in the score from 8 to 9. I am happy with that. Are there any objections? Okay, if you could vote then, members. Yeah, if we could vote. That's Carrie, thank you, Chair. Wonderful. Okay, let's move on then. I'm hoping that you can hear me. Uh, let's move on to item 11, please, Ian. Thank you, Chair, and just scooping through the paperwork to get there. Um, so the next item is the quarterly uh, revenue monitoring report. Um, and as ever, most of the detail is in uh, the table, table three on page 143, uh, which takes you through the various um, changes in the forecast for this quarter. Um, as with the first quarter, uh, we have tended to reflect um, for the COVID-19 impacts, the impacts you sort of know about. Um, so the impacts in quarter one and quarter two, and in some cases, forward forecast of those, but not in all cases. So in the description, in the sort of the fourth column across reasons of difference, there's a bit of extra in there around areas where we sort of think there'll be a further impact arising from COVID-19. And then that is then further added to in the table of table five on page 150, which gives a full list of the events reported at quarter one and quarter two, and then actually what we kind of 
currently thinking of will be a full year impact of those. Um, and you'll note at the bottom of that table, we are looking overall, even with the money from, from central government, at a net impact on our budget this year of around about 1.5 million, uh, but potentially up to around 2 million, given that is a, an estimate at this stage. Um, you know, there's a bit of a guess in there around, because at the time it was written, what the impact on car parking would be throughout this last lockdown period. Uh, and looking at the numbers today, it's not been too bad. Um, so whereas um, it's sort of in the first lockdown period, car park income plummeted to around about 10 to 20% of, of our normal income levels. It's probably a bit more than that, probably about 30 to 40% this time. Um, and hopefully it will recover quite quickly, um, given the stories around that people are, are rushing to the shops, um, hopefully not too many rushing to one shop at the same time, but uh, it will help our car parking income uh, people going into our car parks. Um, so that's kind of the, the sort of the main content of the report. Uh, we have, then has the usual sections in it, um, sort of talking about collection fund and the various risks and etc. and how we do on those. Um, and then in table six on page 151, it's got the impact on our general fund. So based on those forecasts at the start of the year, we're looking at a general fund balance around about 9.4 million. Uh, by the end of the year, it's gonna be around about 7.6 million on current forecasts. Um, you yeah, know, obviously that's not great. Uh, we thought it was a bit higher and back near where it was the start of the year, um, but it, it's manageable in the medium term, um, given, yeah, we'll look at the budget report a couple of items later in the agenda. So we'll see the impact of that as to how that feeds through. Um, that will probably, that's probably I'll stop as an introduction. Um, yeah, you can take questions. How are you here? Yeah. I think we've lost um, the chair. So if we adjourn very briefly um just to make sure see if she can get back in um there are telephone options that may work better for her um can i propose that we pause the live stream and go to a uh, a holding page while we um try to sort out the technical issues sure. thank you happy to do that Thank you. If members could turn off their microphones and their cameras.
Okay, Chair, are you back? back. We did, oh, we've paused. Yeah, that's okay. We, there are telephone options on the um, Outlook if you need to, um, so you could phone. But um, as, we, as we potentially weren't there for the item, um, we're going to ask Ian Cooper just to run through the item again. Um, okay, that's fine. Which item yeah. was it? Item. Uh, so we're still on the um, the second the second quarter revenue monitoring. Um, did you hear all that, um, or do you need? Uh, yeah, kind of. I'm going to go off video. Um, yeah. And stop the incoming video. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so sorry. Which item was it? The, the second quarter revenue monitoring 2020. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Ian, do you want to run through item eleven again? Then apologies for that, guys. Um, thank you, Chair. I'll yeah go through that then. Um, so, um, as ever, uh, table three. Uh, on page 143 onwards uh, provides the various variances uh, and changes um, that we're kind of reporting in this quarter. Um, as we did with the first quarter, um, the focus has been on reporting the things that we know more about, and so things that kind of happened in the first two quarters uh, with some degree of projecting forward for the rest of the year um, because we're sort of unprecedented times and we know there will be impacts going forward for the rest of the year um, in the text in the fourth column across reason for difference uh, where relevant we sort of have highlighted um, some of the um, additional impacts we're expecting in the, in the rest of the year and they are also detailed um, in the table uh, pay on page 150 which is table five and that provides a, an overall summary uh, given the total impact around that 1.5 to 1.6 million although yeah, probably a range about 1.5 to 2 million is probably more realistic overall. Um, so I have uh, in those, you know, one particular area to highlight, I suppose, is car parking income. Obviously, there has been a reduction in that um, during the latest uh, lockdown period, um, but the impact's not been as great uh, by quite a long way as it was uh, in the first sort of more intensive lockdown period, which is sort of seems logical. Um, so, the, so the estimate there's probably about right uh, in terms of that period. Um, you know, uh, in terms of looking forward, this assumes there will be no more um, sort of lockdown periods or, or it sort of more in, intensive uh, restrictions. Uh, but obviously, we don't know what will happen uh, up through to the end of March. So that's just the assumption we're working on at the moment. Um, Contact report is as normal in terms of it goes through various sections around, you know, the variance of reporting to date, um, risks and the corporate financial health indicators in table four on page 148, and um, then looks at the impacts on the collection fund in on page 148, 149. And sort of conclusion is then in the general fund uh, impact table, uh, table six on page 151, and that highlights yeah, whilst we've had a reduction in our general fund reserves during the year or forecast to, uh, it is um, not a catastrophic decrease. And I'm still confident you know, we, we, we can manage through um, to, to, to the medium term. Um, and obviously, come on to that when we discuss the budget in a couple of items' time. Um, so I will stop there and, and invite questions. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions or comments? No, apologies if this is a repeat of what's gone before. I do just have a question over uh, the care line um, uh, impacts there. Uh, obviously significant differences in terms of what we expected and, and what did happen and, and the reasons that are given are all highly plausible. Um, it, has that impacted on the work that we've been looking at previously in terms of care line and, and kind of the drive uh, to to take that in house, and has that, yeah, has there been any impact from that work? Given that this is the situation that we find ourselves in, with bonds. Um, sorry, Joe, I'm not quite sure we were taking it back in house. Um, what are you referring to? 
Sorry, I'm, I'm just unsure as to whether or not I can <laughs> talk about the, the, the detail of it, but the work that we've looked at previously um, with Careline, um, it, which was where we were, we've been selected uh, as a potential uh, supplier for the, for, the whole, for the whole service. And so I know that there were some commercial considerations that we pushed back on, and I think probably through ONS, uh, but I just my my concern is that given that the difference is so, so large in terms of what we expected to spend and what we have, whether or not that those two fields of work have been tied together, because that feels to me like a, a, a good, uh, a, an important commercial consideration in that decision making process. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so, so in relation to discussions with um, Hertfordshire County Council um, around taking on. Um, their um, sort of telecare um, type, type service, uh, they're still ongoing um, and, and sort of still looking at the detail of those um, and hopefully we'll reach a, a positive conclusion in relation to those. Um, so, yeah, so much for my confusion. So, this is sort of slightly different service. There's Careline uh, has been in existence for quite a number of years uh, and the sort of telecare service from, from Hertfordshire County Council is subtly different to it. But, yeah, there, there is still a proposal to kind of bring, bring that. that County Council service it, it, under, your, under the remit of uh, Careline. Right, and so so ju just to be clear, then the, the the large variations we're seeing in in financial impact there, which are completely understandable, that has fed into the considerations on the commercial arrangements with regard to those conversations with Hearts County Council. Yes. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, are there any other um, questions or comments on, on this report? No, let me just go right back to the beginning of it and make sure I've got the recommendations right. Okay, so uh, so we, we will be sending this, is the committee happy to send this to cabinet for their, um, for their, for them to note and for them to approve uh, these changes as noted in the recommendation. Are you all happy to send that? Do we need to vote on that? Yes, please, Chair. Oh, we do. We need to vote if we're happy to send that with these recommendations on. That's carried, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, back to you then, Ian, for the uh, investment strategy mid-year review. Thank you, Chair. Um, so focus first on table two on page 158 and 159. Um, you'll note that the kind of the big movements between this year and moving capital spent to next year uh, relate to the two sort of large items uh, that are kind of the, I suppose, more investment side uh, in relation to um, acquisition of property investments and providing housing market rents. Um, that's just due to sort of timing uh, and, and the general market conditions at the moment in relation to, to acquisitions. Um, so there's a proposal there to shift those into next year, uh, which seems, seems reasonable and sensible. Um, the other thing to sort of highlight mainly from this report is that um, we are dealing with a number of grants and schemes and money uh, at the moment, which means our cash balances are quite high. Uh, which seems bizarre, but you know, there's a lot of um, business grants that we're, we're administering, which is you know, a lot of work for the uh, for the revenues team, uh, and they're dealing with those. But yeah, we, we have got the cash uh, for, for those in, in our balances, and at the same time, um, returns on, on cash at the moment are very very low. Um, you know, this time last year, we saw about getting one percent return, and that being lower than usual. But but that was what the kind of the benchmark was. Um, we, we're now looking at 0.1% is probably a, a, a good number to be getting uh, for, for, for a new investment at this stage. Um, yeah, yeah, you'll note from the, sort of the table on page 161 um, that we have got some amounts lower, but higher than that, uh, and that reflects the, 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 the situation that we've got some historic um, investments um, that are in place still and we'll, we'll reach their maturity at some point. And, and, and those numbers will plummet for some of those. You know, there's one sitting there, one point two five percent. That that will, when that matures in uh, thirty seven days time, at the end of September, if that's already matured. But but now we're talking about it. Um, that will be replaced by a much lower lower interest rate to replace it. 
uh, whilst not directly related to this, but it does kind of invest, affect Treasury uh, and the capital programme uh, as part of the spending review or alongside the spending review, there was an announcement into um, borrowing from Public Works Loan Board, uh, which is the essentially the go-to place for borrowing um, for local authorities. Uh, whilst we're not directly in a borrowing position at the moment uh, because of our capital reserves, uh, at some point in, in future years it will be um, in common with most other local authorities. Um, and the implications of that are the rates have gone down on that borrowing. Um, so uh, a while back they were increased to sort of stop local authorities embarking on, on speculative investments. They've now been dropped back down again, uh, but that comes with, with some conditions. Uh, and those conditions are that if you have anything in your capital programme, uh, even if you're not paying on funding from borrowing, um, that you can't, that, that relates to uh, an, um, an investment purely to generate money, purely for income, um, uh, in terms of capital, then you can't borrow from the PWB for, that, for, that, for anything in your capital programme at all. Um, so that may restrict some of the things you may have planned. Uh, we just have some uh, ideas about using our capital reserves, uh, so not using borrowing um, to fund um, some potential uh, property acquisitions, um, but we'll have to review that now in, in light of those announcements. So uh, alongside Steve Crowley uh, in the uh, Director for Commercial, we're looking at the implications of that uh, and that will feed through as we go into um, setting the investment strategy for next year, which will be obviously going to full council in February. Uh, so those are the sort of highlights and the port and the updates. Um, again, so any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, questions, comments? Got no hands up. Okay, the the the, um, the recommendations here are then that we that we forward this through to cabinet with with some quite significant recommendations on this. You could just make sure you've taken a look at those on page one five five and one five six. I want to make sure that we've considered those carefully. Um, So made in the forecast expenditure, approving the adjustments to the capital programme, um, noting the availability of, of resources and recommending that it notes the position for the Treasury Management Activity as at the end of September 2020. Uh, can we take a vote on whether we're happy to, go to put that to the Cabinet with those recommendations on? Thank you Chair, that's carried. Wonderful. Okay. And then if we just, one second. All right, I think we're on to item 13, draft budget report. Back to you, Ian. Thank you, Chair. This is the first uh, version of the budget report. Um, the main purpose of the report at this stage is to sort of highlight um, sort of some of the base positions and to um, provide feedback from um, the budget workshops which took place uh, earlier in November um, to Cabinet so they can kind of consider the comments from those workshops in determining um, what, what savings uh, and capital program items to take forward uh, as part of the budget that will obviously make its way to, to full council in February. Um, so um, the details of what was presented to the budget workshop are presented in appendices, two appendices and um, the kind of comments from the workshop were kind of captured because there weren't many of them we've captured in, in the report itself. So in relation to um, the savings investments, uh, they're mainly captured in uh, paragraphs 8.9, uh, 8.10 and 8.11. Um, so that's where we sit on those. Um, the conclusion position at the point we wrote this report is set out uh, in table three, which kind of builds together the, the wider picture um, and shows sort of funding shortfall to be met at the bottom of there. Um, because of the changes made in relation to um, updating infla inflation amounts, um, particularly in relation to pay, um, the numbers have come down a bit. Um, so you may remember from I mean, it's a medium term financial strategy looking at 2.65 million. We're now looking at 2.1 million ish. Um, 
so it's still a big number, um, slight improvement, uh, but still doesn't take away the need to take action in future years. So as we move through into next year, um, assuming you know, this budget is taken forward in, in broad this, this format, um, there will be a need to identify future savings in future years to, to achieve a balanced budget on a medium term basis. Um, again, I think I'll pick up here a kind of quick update from the spending review, uh, which actually provided a bit of useful information. Sometimes um, it's, it's at high level, you don't really get anything out of it. Um, but in terms of things to be aware of in terms of budget, um, there is a commitment from government um, to continue some support for local authorities uh, moving forward into the first part of next year. They announced a, an amount of 1.55 billion to be spread uh, probably on a formula basis amongst all local authorities, so both district, uh, borough, um, unitaries and, and counties. Um, um, in relation to spending pressures in relation to COVID-19. Uh, and then I also announced um, the continuation of the income guarantee in the period from April to June next year as well, um, which I suppose is better than I've kind of thought might happen. Um, I thought it'd be complete silence on that, on that matter. So it's good that confirmation. Um, obviously it'd be interesting to see you know, how long the impact of, of COVID-19 continues into next year. Um, Obviously, commitment for April, May, and June is great for that period. But if the impacts are going on beyond that, uh, we'll obviously start petitioning government for, for more support than they've already promised. Um, but there's no point doing that yet until we know we might sit in that position. Um, also, no details yet, uh, but they have committed to an additional year of new home bonus in terms of the amount we get, an uh, additional year of, of reward for it. Um, so that probably increase the forecast we've got in the budget as it stands. Um, we'll have to wait for the detail about what that is because there's a number of ways they can calculate that bonus. Um, so some positive news there. I guess the kind of main bit of um, bad news is there's no commitment in terms of when they'll, they will look at um, future funding for the local government, uh, which means we might continue for certainly probably into next year and probably even beyond um, not knowing what a medium term settlement um, for, for the council will be. Um, and that also makes it difficult for us to uh, look at our budget on a medium term basis and we don't know what our funding is doing on that basis. Um, so it's got some concern there. Um, in terms of things like um, council tax referendum principles and inflation on the amount of business rates we can retain, they seem to be broadly in line with what we're expecting uh, based on the announcements. Um, so we will feed all that through into the next version of the budget report, which we're going through this committee and through cabinet in, in January, um, and then on to council in February, so just like to run an update for you. Uh, sort of news is a bit more hot off the press. Um, as ever, yeah, I have taken more questions, but I think that's probably enough for introduction. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Um, any questions or comments for Ian? Oh, I've frozen. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Chair. Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Uh, I've got no hands up at all. Um, I'm taking it that there are no questions or comments. Um, okay, so the recommendations for this one then is that we that we pass this through to, to Cabinet and recommend that they note the forecasts, that they note the comments made at the workshops uh, they note, um, and comment on the inclusion of revenue savings and investment and capital investments in the draft, and that we the Cabinet confirm the council tax increases for 21-22 will be in line with the MTFS. So um, it's everybody happy to pass this on to a cabinet with those recommendations on. If we could just take a vote, please. Everybody is. What an agreeable lot. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice and easy when there's just us three. <laughs> okay, right. So the final piece then, um, sorry about that, Sky News. Uh, the final piece uh, that we need to just look at uh, tonight is item number 14. So possible uh, agenda items for future meetings. Um, and what I've got here, 
um, our suggestions. And if anybody else wants to put their hand up with anything that they particularly want to see at these meetings, I'm happy to have these suggestions. So we've got the annual audit letter, uh, certification of claims and returns annual report, corporate business planning revenue budget and investment strategy with the integrated capital and treasury. Honestly, I feel like I'm just saying words right now because that all just feels like the right thing to do. Um, and I've, I think we should be a little bit led. So if there's anything that you think we're drastically missing, I think that would be a useful uh, thing to stick your hand up and let us know now. Um, but failing that, I am very happy to, to bow to Ian and Ian's uh, experience in what we should be talking about on the forward plan. Uh, but bearing in mind that we have discussed tonight the need to get together with ONS at the beginning of the civic, civic year. Uh, Sam North, you've got your hand up. Thanks, Chair. The only thing that I would ask is there have been a lot of uh, individual grant schemes that have come forward um, through uh, the government for uh, areas that we've had to um, support, where it, whether it be businesses or individuals, and it'd be good just to um, recognise the work that's been done um, by a, a lot of officers and uh, from all different departments, and perhaps to receive a, an update um, as to uh, how that is going and how that has, has been. I don't know whether that would need to sit under ONS or Finance Audit and Risk, um, but I think either way, both um, committees uh, are very grateful for the work that has been done. Thank you, Sam. I think that's uh, that's a really good point. And as uh, Adam is also nodding there, um, I, I'm very happy to have that on the ONS agenda um, as, uh, in terms of uh, without wishing to produce uh, or create work for people. I think a, a summary update on how that's on how that's uh, happened would be would be wonderful and obviously an opportunity to say well done and thank you i think it was interesting to hear from uh the 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 um uh, uh saf's uh, uh, oh, what's his name nick is it nick <laughs> i think it was interesting to hear that this evening in terms of uh, the the massive increase in work that occurred uh, that occurred over the summer there so i think that that just goes in line with actually that means that there were there were massively increased opportunities for that which means that also uh, highly increased workload elsewhere so yeah I, I, I really welcome that um anything else that anybody thinks is missing drastically of this forward plan at this stage no okay so our next meeting is the 18th of january so i think i should just say be the first to say have a great christmas and a great new year um, although I'm sure that I'll see you all in between now and then, <laughs> certainly you, Mr. Albert. <laughs> um, and thanks for joining this evening. And please encourage uh, other colleagues to, that should have been here to, to attend, because although it's been lovely, I think it, it sometimes might be better to have a, a, a more lively debate um, when we're scrutinising as, as is our role. And thanks for bearing with me on my technical difficulties this evening, which only happened after the Toga Road arrived. So I think there's, a, there's something there. <laughs> All right, um, and so with that, I'll say good evening and have a nice week. Thank you.